There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. I'm very happy to be with you here today. Uh, again, I'm Stephanie Butler, and I get to do these talks every so often. It's a real pleasure, a real treat for me to do the research. And there are rabbit holes galore to go down, and it's always really a challenge to keep what I'm, what I'm going to speak about uh, to, the, to the, the topic at hand, because I want to go in all these other directions as well. Um, and as Dennis said, um, I'm here representing the Southern Oregon Historical Society, which has a very large collection of artifacts from Jackson County's history and highlighting uh, the lives of many, many different people who lived here, including Peter Britt. Um, I want to thank, first of all, there are many other researchers who've done uh, talks and articles on Peter Britt. I want to thank them for their hard work. I've referenced many bits and pieces of those uh, researchers work and it's really a team effort when we come together to do these these presentations because we are drawing on each other's expertise and um, and, and the gems that we we find as we go through the research process um, and also to thank the archival staff the archivist and the other volunteers and staff at the Historical Society Research Library in downtown Medford. Um, they're extremely helpful and they are the ones who keep watch over all these documents and make sure that we can find them as we need them. Um, the story of Peter Britt, and for some of you, um, it may be somewhat redundant in places here, is, is um, is something that many people have a, a, some interest and sometimes a lot of interest in a, and a knowledge about. We've all heard of Peter Britt. We know about the Britt festivals in, in Jacksonville and so forth. Um, and my goal in doing the research for this talk today was to see if I could glean some fresh insight, um, not so much about his achievements as a vintner and a horticulturalist and, and that kind of thing, but to see if there's any personal personality that emerges from his relationships with other people or his relationships with his work and his own family. So we'll see, we'll see what we can find as we go forward in this. Um, there's very little information other than the family genealogy, uh, the family tree, so to speak, that we have about Peter Britt's early life. We know that he was born in Obstald in Switzerland, which is a small village. I'll get to that a little bit later in, in more detail. Uh, we also know that his uh, father's name was Jacob, his mother's name was Dorothea, very tight-knit little community in Obstald, and that they had lived in that community, that branch of the family, for hundreds of years. Um, and before that, the ancestors came from somewhere in England. Um, that's the sort of basic overview of what we have about his, his life um, in the early years. Um, and we, we did an exhibit at the, what we now call the old Jacksonville Museum in the old courthouse in downtown Jacksonville. Um, in 2004, it was the last large exhibit about Peter Britt and his life that uh, was on display in this area. And I was working in the museum at that time, but as an educator. Um, and I spied a, a very interesting small object um, in, the, in the myriad of other objects that reflected Peter Britt's life, his home furnishings, his photography studio, backdrops, his cameras, um, all those kinds of things that illuminate who he was and how he lived. Um, and this small object really piqued my interest. Um, and I'll just show you if you can see it. There it is in one of its forms. It, it is a transformational little object, which you'll see in a moment. Um, and it really caught my eye. And I asked the curator at the time um, about it, and they had simply a, a very simple sign on it that said, uh, sundial compass. Okay, it looked very old to me, so that piqued my interest as well. And on the back side of it, um, we see that there are is an engraving, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, and, and it said that the engraving was in German. And I asked the curator, well, what does the engraving say? Can we turn it over? Can we translate it? What, what is the, the purpose of the engraving underneath? And it, it just was not good timing. That was not to happen at that time. But then a couple of years ago, when I started working as the curator of collections, as Dennis mentioned, uh, on a volunteer basis for the society, um, I got a request from a Professor Schultz from Brown University who said he was coming this way and he is a camera 
historian. He's a collector of, of early camera and photography equipment. And could he possibly stop at the warehouse and see some of Peter Britt's cameras and equipment? And in my search to bring out some artifacts to share with him, I rediscovered this little sundial compass. Can I turn the light on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Do you like the lights off? If, if it would help people to see better with the lights off, we can try that. I have to see a little bit to see my script, but we'll see how that goes. Is that better for people to see? All right, so this is the, this is the face view of it. Um, it's a sundial and a compass, as I mentioned, and it opens up. And this is kind of going to be a metaphor for our talk today, that the, the sort of discovering, the opening up, the, the putting together the parts and pieces of this life of Peter Britt. Um, you'll see the ring on the exterior raises up. That is engraved with n Roman numerals um, that show the time. All right, and then on the, on the right-hand side, I'll use my pointer if you can. Oops, I went back too far. Um, there is a little red dot, which you may or may not be able to see very well, but right here is this arm that raises up. It lifts up off the base of the, of the compass. Um, and when you raise that up, that is how you read the latitudes that you're looking for. Um, and then on the back side, as I, as I mentioned, there is an inscription. And there are several lines. The first line, which is here, and I'm going to butcher the Latin, so please forgive me in advance. Um, the, the engraving is Elva Poli, which is Elevatio Poliarum, which means latitudes of cities. Underneath that is the first of three cities that are listed that show their latitude. The latitude numbers appear on the far right. You can't even see them anymore because there's, there's tarnish and so forth on the actual compass, so you can't read them very well. But the first city is Gibraltar, which is Gibraltar, um, Petersburg, and Jerusalem. Okay, very interesting. Now, we know from research that this compass was made circa 1770 in Augsburg, Bavaria, um, by a very notable um, compass maker named Lorenz Grossel. And he lived between 1740 and 1805. Um, these were high-tech instruments of their time. They were equivalent to what we might call a global positioning system. To, you would know where you are in space, um, kind of a thing. And we don't really know why the three cities are different on different compasses, except that we know from, and I learned this from the Compass Museum, there is a Compass Museum in the world, um, that the latitude scales on the pocket dials or sun watches um, needs to just cover the area in which is intended to be used. And the span typically measures about 20 degrees in Europe at this time, okay? You're not going to have um, other, other areas of the world included, um, including what we call the United States at this time. However, nautical and professional equinoctial compasses that were used by explorers had to be usable in the entire world. Um, and the latitude scale on those compasses had to be representative of any location on Earth, which means that they went from a zero to 90 degree uh, reading on the latitude. All right, so this little compass, hidden away in all the Brit artifacts, to me, was a completely fascinating instrument. We know that the Brit family, when they were living in Obstalden, were agricultural people. They were farmers. Um, of course, compasses and sundials using for, for crops and when to plant and where the sun is located and all those kinds of things are very important instruments. Um, as I said, he was, Peter Britt was born in Obstald in Switzerland. It's a tiny little village uh, of about 430 people today. It's slightly smaller today than it was at the time that he was born and living there. He was born in 1819, and he had an older brother, Casper, who was born in 1808. Um, and I'm just going to forward here to show you the map. It's kind of far away, but again, my little pointer. Over here, this little strip is Obstalden, all right? And Obstalden exists in what's called the Canton of Glarus, and a canton is effectively a state, so the state of Glarus. It has now been incorporated into what we call Canton uh, Nord, uh, Glarus Nord, which is North Glarus. Um, and 
it seems a very much a world away from where we are now, but very excitedly when my husband and I were planning a trip this past fall to go to Germany and Switzerland um, and to um, Austria, we visited Obstalden because it was right on our way. <laughs> so, and I was thrilled. I was absolutely ecstatic about that. And it's, it's a very interesting little village. It's, it's high up in the Alps. Um, you get a some, somewhat of a sense. You can see mountains in the background on here. This is the main road that goes through the village of Obstalden. Um, there really isn't much there. You drive up a very long paved switchback road up and up and up and up. And to drive through the main street, which is effectively what you see here, takes under five minutes. People whiz through Obstalden on their way to other places, effectively. But we stopped, and um, there was a little place to park on the side of the road just to the left. And um, we parked and walked around a little bit. I was very excited to find that right in the center of the village is a church. Um, and that the church was open um, for us to go into. Um, the church was started and the first version of this church was built in 1300. It's been there a very long time. And it's a Protestant reform church. And as you can see inside, it's whitewashed. It's very welcoming. There was nobody around. It was quiet and, and peaceful, sun streaming through the windows. Um, and very austere. The, the woodworking, the pews, all of those things very much intended for you not to be reflecting on anything else but uh, the good book, so to speak. Um, and this over here on the left, the slide over here, shows the pulpit with a stairway leading up to it. Um, very lovely little church. In the very far back room, there are murals still that you can still see on the walls from the 15th century. Okay, really, really lovely little place. Um, and um, I'll get to this in just a second. Um, this is a neighboring village. Um, we found that with all of its beauty and the stunning vistas and all the rest of it, it was rather a stubborn little place. It didn't give up much information. As I said, there really wasn't anybody around. I think people who live in Obstalden are going to other places nearby in other areas to work and make their livings and that kind of thing. Um, and we walked around and I looked at the cemetery and we, we did all the things we could, we could do. And there's a lake called the Wallen Sea. Wallen, Wallen, it's Lake Wallen, really. Z, a C S E E means lake in, in Swiss. So uh, the Wallen Sea is down below the village of Upsalden. It's an enormous lake. And I kept saying to my husband, there's got to be a way to access the lake from here. As high up as we are, it wouldn't make sense for you to be living in this area and not have access to the lake, which is where you would have transportation by boat, which is where you had access to fishing and other things like that. And he was very insistent that there's no way down, there's no road, we can't get down from here, we're too high up. Um, and we had a little argument about that. But we had other places to go, so off we went. Well, my husband being the son of a physicist and a scientific mind in his own right, he started to think about this. Um, and he, he thought about it enough so that he said, when we were passing through again, let's stop again. And I said, why? We, we've seen it. He said, well, let's just see if you're right. There maybe has to be another way to get down to the lake from this village. It doesn't make sense otherwise. Well, on the switchback road going back up this mountainside, he found a hairpin turn off to the right. It was very sharp. And he goes, that's not a driveway, that's a road, let's go that way. So sure enough, we turned off and we came to this village, Mulehorn. And Mulehorn is about two miles down the mountainside from Obstalden. Um, but Mulehorn has a railroad station, right? And it's right on the floor of the valley and it's right next to the lake. So that makes, made complete sense to me that even at that early, those early years, uh, you would need access. Now, one little thing I'm gonna point out here you can't see it that well, but this is a church in Mulehorn, and the steeple, you see the steeple is very pointed. Um, we're gonna look at that in just a few minutes. Um, as, as Dennis pointed out at the beginning, we have many of Peter Britt's paintings in the storage facility, and I was curious to find if some of the vistas that we would see in Switzerland and from Obstalden might be images that he actually painted. And sure enough, here we have, and again, I apologize for the distance away, but we'll get close-ups in just a second. This right here is Obstalden. And you see the steeple of the church and the church itself is exactly the same, has not changed. 
all right? We know probably that Peter Britt sketched images of his village before he left as a young man when he was 26 years old and brought the sketches with him to America. He then later painted these images on canvas from those sketches. Um, and if you see very far away, and again, we'll get a close up in just a minute where the red dot is, this right here is Mulehorn. It sticks out just a little bit into the lake. And this is the Volensee, the lake. Um, okay, two more here. Again, uh, you can see his images of the, the mountains, very dramatic. He's a little over dramatic in terms of what it really looks like, but that must, you know, that, that was the way it looked with mountains all around it. And to the right here, again, here's the church in Obstald, and in this right here is the road, the main road that I was talking about that goes right through. And here, again, on the right, that's Mulehorn. And if you can see very far away, but there's the church in Mulehorn that I just showed you the steeple of. It's right there. And the orientation of the church in Mulehorn today is exactly the same as it is um, in real life. Um, there we go. This is a colorized photograph of Obstalden, again with a view of the lake. And this right here is the church in the center. Off to the right, we were right across the street from, from this building here, is a school. And that is still a school today. Um, and again, we go, this is another, this, and I should mention that painting I just showed you, the, the image of this and the painting before it, um, Britt titled it Swiss Village. He did not name it Obstalden, um, even though it was his home village. So that was an interesting point. This painting, which he's, he'd also done, um, is called Swiss Scene. And again, I looked very carefully at the close-ups, and I'll give you a close-up of this. There's the, there's the church steeple that I believe is the Mulehorn Church right there. And again, on the right, you can see that the steeple itself is virtually identical to the steeple of the church today, with one major difference, that right here, if you see on the right, there is a clock there today. And the clock is one of those late Victorian black clocks with the gold Roman numerals on it and so forth. So it's very likely that if that is Mulehorn, which looks very similar, you can even see the same opening outwards from the lake beyond the mountains, that um, that clock was added at a later time after Peter Britt left. Um, so that's... Um, and then for a young man like Peter Britt, he was, as I said, he was 26 years old when he left Obstalden. He and his father, who was 70 years old in 1845, and his brother Casper, his wife Anna, and their children all decided to join other Swiss who were coming to the America and they called themselves Lucerners or Glarners. Um, and they were coming to America, they were emigrating to the United States for a better way of life. And the reason why Britt's family decided to come was because his mother Dorothea died in 1844. And they decided they would go, they had nothing really in terms of immediate family to hold them. They had cousins and aunts and uncles, but they had no other immediate family. They decided to go on the adventure of coming to the United States. Um, they traveled to Zurich um, and they got on a ship called Rose and they traveled to New Orleans, Louisiana. From New Orleans they traveled to Highland, Illinois where there had been a Swiss colony established in 1803 in a very early time period. So there was a Swiss colony, a Swiss group of people who were already living there, familiarity and that kind of a thing. So they moved to, um, to Highland, Illinois. At that point, uh, Peter and his brother, Casper, purchased 120 acres of land um, for agricultural purposes. They were going to continue farming. Casper also had aspirations to be uh, a minister and to start a religious community in Highland um, and so forth. And his father, uh, Jacob, did woodworking while he lived in, in, in Highland, cabinet making and that kind of a thing. So they all found their, their calling. Peter. Um, being the artist that he was, was an itinerant artist for a time period. He traveled the countryside, he painted people's portraits for small fees and so on. But then he discovered, he heard about this new art called photography. And there was a man um, uh, named John Fitzgibbon that, who was practicing f photography in St. Louis, Louisiana. And Fitzgibbon was one of the early expert 
photographers. Um, and he and Britt found out that he, for a small fee, would teach other people about photography. So he traveled the 35 miles to St. Louis and he studied with Fitzgibbon. Um, and that was a life-changing moment for him because he realized, obviously, that you know, portrait painting, landscape painting, being an itinerant artist, he, he was going to make some money, but it wasn't going to bring him an, an actual career or, or make a good living from it. But this new art of photography has, was going to transform all of that. It was going to wipe out, to a large degree, the opportunity for painters um, and, and to create this whole other way to capture images of people and images and that kind of a thing. So he, he took hold of that and ran with it. There's Highland right there. It's a stereoscope view of Highland, um, Illinois, uh, around the time when Britt and his family moved there. Um, my husband looked at that and he looked at the pictures we took in Upsaldon and said, why the heck would you move to Highland, Illinois after <laughs> coming from the Swiss Alps, right? But um, it was an opportunity they couldn't pass up. All right, and there's Britt as a young man, probably around the time that he emigrated to the United States in his mid-twenties. And then here is the camera. It's a daguerreotype camera um, that John Fitzgibbon recommended be his first professional camera. And we have that camera in um, the collection at the Historical Society. Um, it's this little small box camera and, and it has, uh, we call it the Voigtlander and the reason we call it the Voigtlander is because uh, uh, this, this professor from Brown University told me this, that in early days um, they referred to the camera, when they talked about the camera, they were actually referring to the lens itself. And the lens is a Viennese-made Voigtlander lens, very, very high quality for its time in the 1840s. So, and the box around it, the camera box, was, was just the thing to hold it. Um, and we, of course, have morphed that into the camera is the body of the camera and the lens and all the parts that go with it kind of, kind of thing. But this is the, uh, the first camera that Britt ever purchased uh, for professional use. And he actually opened his own uh, photography studio in Highland and ran that for a number of years quite successfully. He actually made, made money doing that. Um, one of the things I wanted to just pause about for just a moment, which was so fascinating, and it, this is why we, we welcome people to come into the collection who have a certain expertise about certain items, because we learned so much from them. And this Professor Schultz came and examined very carefully all of Peter Britt's camera equipment that he had used throughout the years. Um, and he remarked more than once about how astounding it was that the condition of the cameras was so good. Um, he said, especially when you got into, and this is uh, beyond my technical expertise and, and, and so forth, but when you get into the wet plate process of creating photographs, there was a wet plate and a dry plate and a daguerreotype, all these different things, but the wet plate process means you were dealing with, with water. And he said it's highly unusual to find a camera this early, which dates to the 1840s, 1847 approximately, to be in this good of condition. Um, and then in the wet plate cameras, he has a, what we call a John Stock camera, which was a wet plate camera. He said it's pristine. He said Britt obviously cared very deeply about his equipment. He was scientific about his care. He wiped down the cameras after every use. He made sure that there was no rotting of the wood and so on and so forth. He kept them in a dry place when he wasn't using them and so forth. So these are little insights. These are the little insights we get about what kind of personality Britt might have been. I really consider him to be a, a, a real combination of artist and scientist all together. I mean you had to be a bit of a scientist to deal with the photographic processes that he did, um, especially early on. And after he had his training from Fitzgibbon, he was on his own as a photographer. He was self-taught after that, um, which is an, an astounding thing. Um, and fa fa following the, the death of his father around 1849, um, Britt decided he heard gold was being discovered on the West Coast and so forth. And he and four other Swiss uh, friends of his from Highland decided that they would make the journey across to, uh, to Oregon. Um, he took 300 pounds of photography equipment, which he had accumulated. He sold his photography studio, and with these three other friends, they decided to come across to the West Coast. And part way across, the friends got a little irritated because Britt was moving at a, as, at them at a slower pace because of the weight of the equipment they were hauling in this wagon. 
So they decided to split up and go their separate ways, and so they cut the wagon in half. <laughs> and and Britt continued and finished his journey into, into Oregon with a two-wheeled cart, essentially, uh, loaded down with 300 pounds of photography equipment, um, which is pretty astounding. Um, he, he said this in an interview uh, later in his life um, before he died. He said, I have always loved nature, and when I heard of the beauty of Oregon, I resolved to go west. I believed I could make a good living in the daguerreotype business in the Oregon country, so in the spring of 1852, I loaded my equipment in a covered wagon and started west. Um, and then he, he found when he got to Oregon City that uh, he, there was all kinds of words swirling around about Jacksonville or a place called Table Rock City, which was the earliest name for Jacksonville. Um, and he determined that he was going to come down to Jacksonville and see what was going on with gold being discovered and, and the like. Um, and this, of course, is a very familiar painting of, um, of Jacksonville, which many of us are familiar with. Um, that he did later on from his view on Brit Hill, which is where the Brit Festival is now. And what he did was he staked a claim with his little wagon full of equipment and he, he built a cabin on, on that site um, in 1852 and he made his living for a short while mule packing, doing some prospecting and that kind of thing until he got his, his, his way about him and then he started doing photography again. He opened the first photography studio in Jacksonville in that little cabin. Um, one of the things we're, we're very lucky to have of Peter Britz are many, many of his diaries. Um, he wrote them largely in German. He was a Swiss German speaking person. Um, and he, he left diaries that span from 1859 um, into the 1890s, handwritten and on and on. And so everybody goes, ooh, wow, diaries, great stuff, right? Well. For those of you who are expecting intriguing stories and all those other kind of things, you'll be sorely, sorely disappointed, I'm afraid to say, because he was, again, very scientific in the way he recorded information in these diaries. Um, we have great luck that there was a woman named Ellie Beck, this was probably back in the, in the 1990s, who was a German speaker herself who meticulously transcribed from the German to English so that we have a copy in English of what his diaries actually said. Um, in, an, in a thorough reading of the diaries, well let me just go back for a second because there's, there's a lot of other information. He, he was recording things about the weather from early on. He was recording temperatures. He was interested in all of that. Um, and he also recorded things about horticulture and plants that um, may or may not be of interest to other people, but for example, he writes in very scientifically specific language. Um, in fact, he wrote, for example, in the, in the 1850s, magnolia purpurea, purple magnolia, May and June, 8 to 10 feet. Rus colinus, Venetian lomac fringe tree, July to September, 8 to 10 feet, light purple. Euonymus americanus, American burning bush, 5 to 8 feet with scarlet berries, fall and early winter, and so on. So this is page after page of this kind of information. In a thorough reading of these diaries, which I did, I found only a handful of entries in which Britt gave any indication of his personal feelings or thoughts. Um, use of the word I <laughs> is almost entirely absent in his diaries, except when he uses it in relation to work, which demonstrates that the diary really functioned as a business accounting and scientific planning record of his life at that time. He was beginning to buy land, he was beginning to plant, experiment with plants and trees, um, ordering plants and trees from companies all up and down the west coast and even from the east. Um, in, uh, in one of very few references to I, he once wrote on March 11th, 1861, I am overworked, put yellow violets in compost. <laughs> <laughs> little tiny things like that, little tiny things. Once he wrote, he had a, an injured toe, he wrote about his injured toe, and he, once he had a tooth pulled, he writes about having his tooth pulled. But again, it's very succinct, very very simplistic language, nothing, nothing detailed. Um, they're very repetitive entries, but also in them a picture emerges from a very early time period, from the 1850s onward, of 
who the people were in Table Rock City and then Jacksonville who were around him and what his relationship to them was. Now, he was a landowner, he, 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 he also was a landlord, he rented properties, he sold properties, he was an astounding human being in so many different ways. And he was very meticulous in his recording of his relationships with people and so forth, especially business dealings. If it had to do with money, you can be sure there's an accounting of it and there's a response. All right. So, for example, he'll he'll have transactions recorded, very detailed, such as paid the taxes, or received rent five dollars from the old ones. Well, if you read continuously and you, you you start to pick up on the patterns of the writer, you begin to to decipher who he's talking about because you're going who who are the old ones? Like, what does he mean by that? Well, they were two elderly Chinese people, and Chinese were were living and working in Jacksonville in the 1850s and gold mining. Uh, who were renters of his. They were renting property from him. So he called them the old ones. Um, and uh, he, uh, and over and over and over again, and more times than I can even imagine, he writes, received for pictures, which means he was busy. He was taking photographs constantly. Sometimes he rec re records who he's taking the photograph of, but largely he'll often just write, received for pictures, $2. Received for pictures, $20. And so on like that. Um, he also write, wrote in an entry in 1864, John Love, who was a, a relative of the Hanley family who lived out on Hanley Road, or Highway 238, depending on how you, how you refer to it now. Um, John Love three, boxed three dozen pictures, $20 not paid. <laughs> so that shows that he would give credit but that his records also indicate that he closely tracked this information and there are frequent entries noting when, when he had been paid or in some cases when interest was paid um, as in this entry received from Horn $100 interest. All right. The other thing we find in the early diaries is that he records names like, like surnames. He'll write Lobacher, Hill, Horn, Hall, Kubli, Viet Schutz, you know, those types of names and he will write what he purchased from them like Viet Schutz was the brewer. He had the brewery in Jacksonville. And he and Britt were good friends. And Britt, uh, we can tell from his diaries, was a frequent purchaser of kegs of beer. Um, you know, around $10 for a keg of beer. And, and Viet was, was supplying him with this. So we see these little things. We also see lists and lists. We know what project was compelling to him at any given time because the lists in his diary reflect that he was planting that it was spring, that he was planning for spring, that he was building something, that he was uh, working in the fields doing something that related or building his house. He lived in the cabin initially and then built a small house and then a larger house um, when he started his family, um, which housed his photography studio, as you probably know. Um, but things like uh, uh, how much he paid for nails, for lumber, for bearings, I mean, all just on and on and on. We, we see this picture emerge of what, what he was interested in at a given time. Also, there are some little glimmers of what rural life in Jacksonville was like from him, um, but they're very faint. They're just like little references like got brown cow with calf or cow at ranch with bull. Um, Viet brood, always a good sign, um, and that kind of thing. Got three dozen eggs from Fisher um, and then what he paid for the eggs kind of thing. Um, we can't know for certain, but it's almost definite that he brought the pocket dial that I showed you earlier <laughs> with him, and that maybe he continued to use it, but at least it was a reference back to his homeland, to his, early, his earlier life. Um, but it came with him to Jacksonville one way or the other. Um, we know that he was a meteorologist. He tracked the movement of the planets. He began recording meticulously the, the weather and also the temperatures um, and things like that. Um, he referred to his property in, in not very much detail, which is, which is frustrating. There are other researchers right now who are working mightily to, to uncover where he had his vineyard where that first vineyard might have been, and so forth. He had property in Rogue River, he had property in Jacksonville, he had property in, in Griffin Creek, and he refers to them in the diary as the hill, the farm, the ranch, the flat, and the orchard. <laughs> but we don't know where, which ranch, which hill, which orchard, because he had multiple pieces. Um, 
We know that a large portion of his land was eventually planted in grapes and that there are references to ver many varieties of grapes being grown in his property. Um, an article that was published in 1907 that was just two years after his death um, reported that he, meaning Brit, got his vines from California in 1854 or 1855. These were the old mission grapes and they grew so well that he got in other varieties for f and for 50 years carried on the work of demonstrating uh, what were the best grapes for this soil and climate and in that period he grew over 200 varieties of American and European grapes. And that was published in the Oregonian in uh, September 1907. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a search on right now for finding the, the uh, how to, I don't know what to call it, the agricultural slash archaeological evidence of those first grapevines and where they were planted. Um, because there's a lot of debate across the state. If you're a wine drinker, you might even have heard of it. Uh, the people in Umpqua Valley are not very happy to, that we're saying Peter Grit was the father of the, the grape industry here. They think they were. So there's still a, a, an argument to be had for that. Um, then Peter gets a letter from his brother, Casper, saying that a young woman who had married someone else who had been a love interest of Peter's back in, in Switzerland had been widowed and she had a seven-year-old son. Um, and she was in financial need. And kind of saying, hmm, hmm, what do you think, you know? Britt was single, he had never married, um, and so forth. So Britt decided what he would do is he would write to this woman, her name was Amalia Grob, and she was living in New Glarus, Wisconsin. Um, so there were other Swiss communities in other of those states in Wisconsin as well. And he wrote to her, to her and he basically gave her an option. He said, I will send you money if you need to return to Switzerland and that's what you want to do. I will send you money for you and your son to go back to Switzerland. or you can use the money to come here to Jacksonville and marry me. <laughs> How could you resist? What a proposal. What a proposal. So she came to Jacksonville with her seven-year-old son. Um, and again, in his cryptic way, he didn't really give us anything. Um, he, you know, when she arrived, he only wrote, it was May 11th in 1861, he wrote, Amalia arrived. <laughs> You're like, and? Like something, you know? Um, but he was busy before she got there, which is when he planted the, the yellow violets in the compost by mistake. So he was distracted. I, I take that as a sign <laughs> that he was excited. Um, but anyway, she arrived, and, and then uh, three months later, on August 11th, they married at Casper uh, Kubli's ranch out in the Applegate. Um, and they married, um, and then seven months after that, their son Emil was born. <laughs> yes. Um, so Emil was the first uh, of, of, of three children. There was Emil, Arnold, and then Molly Britt. Um, and his, his land holdings, his interest in exotic plants, all of these things just continued. Um, and he expanded his two-story home to have a, a very large uh, photography studio with a skylight in it at the top and so forth. Uh, and again, even on emotional things though, in the diaries, very little emerges. Um, the second child, Arnold, was born in 1863 and the only entry we find that he writes is says, my boy died. Oh. And that's it. Nothing more. Um, and then later in 1865 when his daughter Molly was born, he writes, a daughter, um, uh, the girl was born at midnight. <laughs> that's it. That's all we have. Um, and then, this is a tiny little assumption on my part. Again, it, it, you have to be careful with this as an historian, uh, not to read too much in, but the most emotional entry that I read in his diaries altogether was when he wrote when his wife died, when Amalia died in 1871, only 10 years after they married, um, he wrote, my dearest good Amalia died today. And that's, that's the most revealing emotional thing that he's, he's put in the diaries from my, my standpoint. Um, following Amalia's death, he raised the children on his own. He did not remarry and, and find somebody else. Um, Emil and Jacob is his stepson, and, and he took Jacob as his own son. And so Emil and Jacob became the two who really worked the land for him. They ran the vineyards, they ran the orchards, they worked the land, they planted the vines, they grafted all, all those types of things. And Molly remains this sort of elusive figure in the background. Um, I looked at all the oral histories for any clue of people remembering her. The only one I could find a reference to was a, a, an older woman and she did an oral history 
I think it was in the 1970s, who had been a child um, and knew Molly uh, as an older woman and said that when she would stop by the Brit house, Molly would give her a cookie. Um, and she was part of the Eastern Star for 50 years. She was one of the longest members um, of the Eastern Star and the secretary of the Eastern Star. But very little is known. And none of those three children ever married and had their own families either. And that is a gift to us in the sense that that's why we have his, his belongings. That's why we have his equipment. Because there was nobody that was, it was being left to. There were no descendants. Um, we know also a little bit, we know he corresponded with Switzerland throughout his adult life. We know that he sent money back home to help other family members throughout his adult life and that his son Emil continued in that process after. We have just a little bit of information about, um, uh, from, from letters that have been transcribed and these uh, little excerpts I'm going to read are from his cousin on February 1st, 1875 from, oh sorry, a brother-in-law, not a cousin, a brother-in-law. Um, he said, we received your dear letter with the greatest of pleasure and learned that all our dear ones in America are in good health. Forgive me, dear brother-in-law, that I have not written sooner, but I do not like to write. And at the same time, I did not have all the news which you wanted to hear from your homeland. Cousin Britt, who lives in Glarus, told me lately that he had sent a postcard to you. He is well and fat, but although he has earnings, he and his wife will never amount to anything. <laughs> Cousin Onley, I met her a short time ago in Obstalden. She is well and goes to Mollus to trade eggs. She was very sorry that she is not younger, as she would be happy to come to you and take care of your household. She believes that she is too old now for such a long voyage. She sends you her very best regards. Um, and as a young man, Emil, emerges to take so tons of responsibility. He really becomes the, the, the focal point as his father ages in terms of learning the photography business and running the, the, the orchard, the vineyard, all of those types of things. Emil also, and this is the legacy part where we begin to see that through line, he also keeps a daily journal all right, for, that, go for, that goes for years. Um, for our benefit, he's a little bit more descriptive, <laughs> uh, which is really nice. We get the temperatures and we get the rainfall and we get all those kind of scientific recordings of things, but he gives us just a little bit more insight um, into what a day in the life was like. For example, this is a typical diary entry. This is just a sampling. May 28th, Jake, which is Jacob, his step brother, plowed on the hill, grafted two vines. August, who's a worker who worked with them, grubbed today. Jake plowed in the flat. May 30th, August worked today. Peter Bruch plowed this afternoon, grafted 11 vines. April 1st, planted charhorn and Zinfandel on the hill today. Peter Bruch plowed this afternoon. April 2nd, paid Peter Bruch plowing on the hill $3 and one gallon of wine. Mm -hmm. right, so he's getting paid with money and with wine, not a bad deal. Um, and so on like that. We also have very specific recorded information for those who are interested in the, the, the vineyard aspect or the, the, the wine grape aspect that Emil writes about the kinds of grapes that they were planting and using and who they were ordering them from. So for example, one entry is John Rock, San Jose today. John Rock is someone who's selling vines. Um, three Similion, three Saint George Pinot, three Sauvignon, three Raisinet, one Muscat Gordo Blanco. Um, we have a, a journal of emails that's titled Grape Book, and he writes a list of all the varieties. And it, it was 1887, they planted a 53 alone in that one year, different ones. So they were really varied in the, in the types of vines they were planting. Um, Another type of entry from Emo, which is interesting, um, he writes in 1889, it was January, he said, very cold this morning, 24 degrees cold, caught a skunk in my new box trap, sold it to Hop for 15 cents. Now Hop would have been a, one of the Chinese who were still living in the, in the Jacksonville area, so he sold the skunk to Hop. Um, butchered Sal's calf, shot at it 12 times before we killed it. <laughs> the steer came home, eclipse of the moon tonight. All right, so that's a day in the life of Emil Britt. He also writes later on in January, commenced snowing about seven o'clock this morning, uh, 26 degrees and snowed some during the day, about three and a half inches fell. Al Sturgis took off hogs we had taken up. We bought two of his for $5. 
Three and a half was cash and $1.50 for feeding them. But the hogs got away and followed the others home. <laughs> we'll have to go after them tomorrow. Children are coasting some tonight. So the children were out uh, on Brit Hill nearby, coasting, sliding in the road. Um, the 18th, he writes, 30 degrees this morning, went after the hogs. It was sunshine and warm. Uh, thawed a little, cold this evening, children are coasting on First Street. And then on the 19th, he writes, 26 degrees this morning, children coasting all day on First Street. <laughs> and then he writes, we coasted some tonight. Very cold. So he went out probably with his, his stepbrother, Jacob, but he would have been a young man in his 20s at that point, and, and, and had some fun too, coasting on the, on the hill on First Street. Um, now, another interesting thing is that um, we, of course, have lived through some fire seasons here in this region, as you know, and, and some of the worst were just this last summer. Um, but there's a lot of fire talk in August and September in both Peter Britt's diary and Emil's as well. So September 1889, he writes, uh, this is Emil, a fire broke out at the mouth of Ashbury Gulch, went up and found it burning very lively, could hear it roar over to the ranch, smoke was very dense. Uh, the next day, he says, went up to look at the fire. The 19th, smoke very dense, cannot see Lynn's house. That's David Lynn, who was the cabinet maker in Jacksonville and the coffin maker. Um, cannot see Lynn's house from here. Sun looked all day like a red ball, and there was no more light than on a very cloudy day. Um, the other thing that both Peter started and, and then Emil carried on in a, in a very serious fashion was the collection of this weather data. Um, and, and, and Emil did it for the National Weather Service. He did it as a volunteer for the National Weather Service, keeping records for something like 58 years. But he was meticulous. He had got that scientific gene from his father. And um, this is quite interesting. This is in February 1889. He wrote, yesterday some boy broke the rain gauge with a slingshot and broke it all to pieces. There were seven eighths in the gauge when it was broken and a quarter inch fell today. So he's gonna, he's gonna keep trying to get that. <laughs> reading. You've got to get it. The next day he wrote, writes, showered all day. No record of any rainfall because he didn't have the gauge. Then the 11th it was fine weather so the next day was okay. And then on the 12th he writes, received rain gauge and two thermometers from ASWS which is the National Weather Service. So he's got his new rain gauges so he's back in business. Um, and after that entry we don't just get inches of rain. We get um, 0.23 inches fell. 0 0.01 inches fell. So he, he must have these very fancy new rain gauges that are more accurate than the ones he was using before. He's clearly enjoying that because he writes great detail about that. Another little, just a tidbit, and I know I'm coming to my end here, but um, I thought this was fascinating. Uh, are you all familiar with the Butte Creek Mill? out in Eagle Point, a fabulous historic mill, which until I'm sorry to say about five years ago, um, a, a, a massive Christmas morning fire destroyed it. But it was a, old, one of the oldest working mills, grist mills in, in the country. And um, anyway, he writes um, in 1889, went to Butte Creek and got a load of flour and 1,575 pounds of bran had vets, wagon, and horses, got very wet on my way home, but not much damage done to the lows. Mm -hmm. So a busy mill, even at that time, they were traveling out to get their, their, um, their flour and their bran and other types of things like that. Um, they worked extremely hard from a physical standpoint, much more so than we are used to today. I mean, I, I read the daily entries, and I just gave you that one example of Jacob and, and Emo working on the land, and they were digging 54 holes for vines, and they were grafting vines, and they were, you know, and they were dealing with animals and so forth. At one point, Emo points out that he was, he now had a, a herd of, of seven cows that he was dealing with. Um, and then there were horses and other things that, that needed tending to. So they were, they were not, uh, they were, they were working very, very hard. Um, and Emil and Molly were very faithful to their father's legacy in the terms of the fact that they kept his camera equipment together. They continued to open the house even after their father died in 1905 to show visitors the photography studio, almost like a museum. And it had been intended uh, by them to continue as a museum, um, but the Brit house unfortunately suffered from two different incidents of fire, one which completely destroyed it, um, but not um, until after the contents luckily had been removed. 
Um, we can credit Mary Hanley. There's an oral history that, that talks about Mary going in and out of the house on trip after trip, taking things um, to, to, to bring out and to include in the museum and the Historical Society's collection. Um, and Peter Britt died on October 4th, 1905 at the age of 86 and he was a charter member of the Southern Oregon Pioneer Association and his neighbors, J uh, Judge Kolvig, and John Cameron and Cornelius Speakman wrote the f this, this final kind of eulogy in the Pioneer Association newsletter about him which I think was quite uh, wonderful. He's, they, they said he was a pure disciple of nature. He held communion with her visible forms and was inspired to act in accordance with the precepts of her open book. He was in every sense a manly man and one that our society will sadly miss. We laid him to rest in the village cemetery covered with the sod of the climb he loved so well. His grave will need no human hand to keep it green. The gentle dews of a western sky and the bright beams of a western sun will kiss into existence the many-hued flowers to deck the grave of one of nature's noblemen. Yeah, thank you.